This is the Getsy Health Podcast with Janique and Tristan Roney. Hey, you guys, welcome back to the Gutsy Health Podcast. We have Gina Warfel with us, who's my co-host. Welcome, Gina. Hey, everybody. Hello. And we also have Dr. Bradley Campbell. Welcome, Dr. Bradley Campbell. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. You guys, we have a really special episode today, and it's probably going to be one that's going to turn heads a little bit because we're talking about the COVID vaccine. But before we go into this topic, I, I kind of want to tell everyone the story of how I came across Dr. Bradley Campbell. I had a follower on Instagram actually tag me and him in a post talking about whole food vitamin C. And rarely do I come across any wellness practitioners, doctors, dietitians talk about like rarely do they talk about whole food vitamin C and the difference between whole food vitamin C and ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is not whole food vitamin C. So when I saw there was a doctor out there talking about whole food vitamin C, I was shocked. I was actually completely shocked because people think I'm a whack for preaching about whole food vitamin C and the P factor, K factor, J factor, right? Like people are like, no, like that's, that's nice. Right. Right. (laughs) And I'm like, no, I promise Mm -hmm. you like Mm -hmm. ascorbic acid is processed. So came across your Instagram account, Dr. Campbell, and you are very pro good information. You do a lot of research. You're really intelligent. And I was watching a video where you were talking about how the mRNA vaccine isn't what everyone is saying it is. And I was watching it and I loved how you explained it. And I immediately messaged you and I said, I need you on the podcast because you're very intelligent. And this is and a topic that we need to unpack. So thank you, Dr. Campbell, for coming on here. Can you tell listeners who you are, how you got here, what kind of doctor you are, all of your freaking degrees? You are really, really brilliant. Tell us who you are. Yeah, so I'm Brad Campbell. I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, north side, and uh, I went I'm trying to think of how long to tell my story, but basically I went to chiropractic and naturopathic school and got finished with my chiropractic degree and got that from National University of Health Sciences in Lombard, Illinois. And uh, while I was there, I just like dived into everything I could possibly do and was doing degrees on at night and on the weekends and was basically also working on what they call diplomates in nutrition, neurology, homeopathy, applied kinesiology, and internal medicine. And then at the end, when I got into my internship and the classes eased up, I also got into acupuncture school and did that for three or four years and just finished that recently. Amazing. And um, yeah, I just dove headfirst into natural health and just like love the profession, love the career, love the philosophy of like how to be healthy naturally. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I was a musician and science as a saxophonist in college. Amazing. And I got to conduct an orchestra and I thought that's what I wanted to do. Uh And I just had this meeting with like 12 doctors and they were all medical doctors and most of them were surgeons and they just were kind of pessimistic about the profession. Like a Mm -hmm. lot of them were like, man, I wish I could have been a nurse or a nurse practitioner or like a dietitian or something else because their family lives were not the best. And Mm -hmm. uh, they were sort of like, well, my wives raised my kids. And I was like, well, my dad did as a dentist and I didn't want to go down the workaholic route. Right. And my chiropractor as a kid saved my life many times. Amazing. And I had a couple injuries in college too, where I did carpal tunnel surgery and I went to my chiropractor and he fixed it in like five minutes. So, okay, maybe, you know, I can help more people getting into natural health doing how my, what my chiropractor did saving my life. And I just really loved the profession. Everyone I talked to has a really balanced life in the chiropractic field. And I just have fallen in love with chiropractic and naturopathic and oriental Chinese medicine and just all of the stuff about it even though I was super skeptical going in because Mm -hmm. I shadowed some chiropractors that would spend an hour with people and some that would spend two minutes. Right. Right. You know, Hmm. and um, I didn't want to be just like the rack em crack em see Mm -hmm. as many people as possible in an hour, but those chiropractors would get amazing results. People would walk in, you know, with a walker or cane, they'd walk out five minutes later feeling fine, which was amazing. But I just wanted to have more patient interaction. I was super into research and uh, read about every book I could on, 
like junk science and placebo stuff and I love it. like snake oil science when I got into school. Cause I was like, what is this herbal stuff? <laughs> what is the whole food vitamin C? What is the synthetic vitamin C? Right. Isn't that real? What's like logical? What's scientific? Mm-hmm. And there is a lack of research on food, but I think it's starting yeah. to come into its own and standard process and mega food and all these other brands are starting to do a lot of this research yeah. finally yeah. with major universities, which is great. But long story short, I just did a lot of natural health degrees. So I have feel like I have a unique perspective on sort of like the alternative Eastern holistic side of the medical spectrum. But my family and a lot of my training was also very Western science evidence based. Mm-hmm. The school I went to was probably the most evidence based chiropractic naturopathic school in the U.S. Yeah. So I also have a love for Western medicine, a love for hospitals and all of those kind of fields as well. So I bridge the gap for a lot of people who aren't sure which where they want to end up. Yes. And I love that you have that balance and we we kind of need both worlds. I mean, if it weren't for Western medicine, Tristan, my husband would be dead, you know, and so I'm so grateful for the doctors and the surgeons that have kept him alive. But then we've needed Eastern to get quality and quantity as well. Right. And so I really love that you have that balance and you respect both worlds. And really, when you utilize data and research and critical thinking, you know, you can come to really great conclusions, but that takes time. And what I've witnessed from you, Dr. Campbell, is that you take time to research and you dig into the weeds and the nitty gritty and come to your conclusions that you're sharing with people. So will you share with listeners your story around vaccines? Uh, because, because your family has a little bit of a history with vaccinations. And I just want to, let's preface, this is not going to be an anti-vax post. I do want to put that out there. If many of you who have been listening to this podcast, we're all about sharing information as unbiasedly as possible. And so there's no agenda here. We're just going to share what we know and let you guys come to your conclusions. So please, please keep listening. Don't think that we're going to bash vaccines. We're going to bash this and we're going to bash that. We're going to really try and have this conversation as level-headed as possible. So Dr. Campbell, tell us a little bit about your Just history. Like with we did, Johnny. You know, when we brought in the juicy stuff on like the sugar debate, yeah. it's not necessarily bash evil sugar no. or, you know, <laughs> it's just looking at the evidence of both sides too. Totally. Something that's such a hot topic. Yes. Yeah. And- I think it's such a complex subject and yeah. you can't make a tweet about something that's so complex as health you know it's such a nuanced debate which is why you Mm -hmm. need long form podcasts like this to discuss it or why i post a five or 20 minute video is because you can't make a tweet or a little post or a little short video about it no you can't so go ahead and tell us about your history with vaccinations yeah so my family has some genetic traits which can make us a little more susceptible to issues with detoxification, allergies, and autoimmunity. And GHFR, some yeah. HQ mm-hmm. um, genes that relate to like celiac and lactose and other things like mm-hmm. that. And I do a long, like I do like a 40 to 60 page genetic profiling on certain patients. So I've run that on myself and it gives you more data than you never really need to know more than 23 million other things. But right. essentially we have some genetic factors we didn't know about. So my mom's a nurse and we were all doing the normal vaccine schedule as kids. And uh, I had some minor, you know, allergies that started possibly like minor seizures or anaphylactic type reactions from vaccines. Whereas my sister had more severe seizures, absent seizures and some um, almost like pseudo guillain barre syndrome type thing mm-hmm. that was transient. It didn't last forever, but yeah. her seizures were to whatever degree maybe impacted by vaccines. Yeah. But that's the big thing is we can never really true cause or correlation with any of this stuff right. because a lot of the vaccines in children are given at a time when there is a typical neurologic regression mm-hmm. at certain periods of age. And a lot right. of the vaccine schedule is set up to be given at those times of neurologic regression. So we weren't sure if my sister was regressing just normally. And then she kind of came back online again mm-hmm. a couple weeks later, which is what happens in most children. They have periods of like fits of rage or like, why is my child at this age now acting like a year younger? Like right. That's part of a normal process of the trimming of your brain development. Mm-hmm. So we weren't really sure, but we are all seem to have some negative reactions and uh, whether it's, and now kind of like with the flu, my mom and uh, my sister both are very negatively react to most vaccines and flu things now. And my mom has struggled with chronic autoimmune and fibromyalgia and Lyme and all kinds of these chronic health issues, a myriad of things that now she's basically recovered from or put into remission, which is great. But 
those issues do put our family or her at a little bit of a higher risk factor for some of the adverse reactions, whether it be short term or long term from these things. Mm. And then my, so I kind of was in the space of like fairly pro vaccine, I would say, like I was probably one of the most pro vaccine people in the natural medical school, because a lot of the natural community is more skeptical than most. And I had an experience where I got a puppy as well in chiropractic and naturopathic school. And he Two days after I got him, I took him to the vet. They gave him his like tri vaccine, his first round, and he had a horrible reaction. He's an Irish setter and he developed a condition called HOD, hypertrophic osteodystrophy, which is osteos bones. So basically Mm -hmm. his bones were self-destructing, which happens on very rare incidents, like less than 1% of Weimariners and Irish setters and Great Danes will have this reaction. And sometimes like him, it's extreme. And it was like, oh, great. I'm this like natural health doctor and my Mm -hmm. dog's having a vaccine reaction, like Mm -hmm. just what I would expect. And uh, so the vets actually wanted to put my dog down. Oh, my gosh. And it was probably like some of the hardest two, three days of my life. Mm -hmm. I was just crying. He couldn't stand up. And thank God we actually found a a veterinary professor in Colorado that figured out if you just give really high dose steroids for like a day or two, Mm -hmm. it just shuts down the autoimmune response and the dog's fine. So we did that and he was literally finding him in like an hour or two. So it was another oh example gosh. of like, you know, Western medicine, maybe causing some problems, but also saving the day. Yeah. that's. Amazing. I think it's really interesting that that is your, your story and your experience. I am curious if you are kind of aligned with the philosophy, because I've asked, I've, I've talked with a few like holistic practitioners or functional medicine doctors of their view on, you know, what do you do with children and vaccinations and that debate? And it, it seemed like the recommendations that they were seeming to give was number one, do gene testing. Yeah. And then number two, maybe give some glutathione and try your best to support detoxification at that time. Is that kind of how you feel about, you know, when deciding to vaccinate children in general or where's your stance there? Yeah, I think I really don't ever make the choice for people. I let them make their own decision Mm -hmm. and really try to give a true informed consent, which is I call BRAN, B-R-A-N, benefits, risks, alternatives, and nothing like what you, what happens if you do nothing. And some people come in very opinionated as patients and they're not getting any vaccines. Other people are getting all the vaccines and Mm -hmm. no matter what I tell them or educate them or resources or books or anything, like they're not going to really sway their mind. Mm -hmm. But I do try to dance and then change the music. I try to meet them where they're at and then help them just grow a little bit more in awareness, a little more education, a little more of the potential benefits if they're on the downside of vaccines, a little more of the potential risks if they're extremely pro and just try to get that nuanced in there because they're not binary. It's not like they're perfectly safe and it's not like they don't do anything at all. Right. So Mm. there are, it is a complex subject, but I do put those things. We have like some protocols we use with patients. One of them's on our nonprofit website right now that we kind of use when people need to detoxify Mm -hmm. from some of the things that are in them. Um, And glutathione is one of them. Sometimes we'll use homeopathic remedies if patients are into that. And uh, vitamin C, ideally a whole food C is Mm -hmm. also really good. I love that. And do you also take that into consideration when they're considering different vaccines? Like, are you looking at them like case by case basis or are you just in general lumping it all together? always a case by case basis. I'm Mm -hmm. blessed to be able to spend 30 to 60 minutes with people. So it's really like customized individual doing genetic testing if they're able to, or looking Mm -hmm. at if we have both their parents, you can kind of guess if both parents have a genetic trait, then you know that the kid's going to have it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we really do it case by case basis. It's really sad that we can't do more research um, with vaccines and genetic mutations for people. That would one, take way too much money than they're willing to put in, but also take a, a lot of resources. And, you know, I, I was even thinking, you know, Dr. Campbell, you've been doing blood work on people before and after the COVID vaccine, and you've been seeing some really like remarkable numbers changing very drastically before and after the vaccine. I wish yes. we could do research on this. I wish everyone that was part of like the research of these COVID vaccines, we were actually checking blood work markers to see what is the actual reaction. We're not just watching them externally and being like, okay, are you going to die or not? You're alive. Great. You know, like what's happening on an immune response level? What, what are the inflammatory markers doing? Like what's like CRP doing? What are the white blood cells doing? You know, like what's happening? Can you imagine a study we're actually looking at 
blood markers before and after. It would be amazing. And it would give us so much data on what, how our bodies really are handling it, right? Exactly. Yeah, I actually have a proposal into one of my, our labs to do that exact study and offer that as like for me and other practitioners to mm-hmm. offer basically like half off or extremely discounted blood work before and after. Yeah. Um, because but the thing is, not a lot of people would want to do that study or participate right. in that study right. Right. because it might a lot of people sort of want to get a vaccine and not really admit that mm-hmm. there could be a downside. It's hard to admit that we might be doing something that could save our lives, but is could have a potential, you know, adverse side effect. Right. And an adverse side effect that but is. Yeah, we are doing that research. Yeah. Well, and an adverse side effect that is not showing now, but can show later down the line. Like, you know, ignorance is bliss sometimes, right? Correct. So are you monitoring just immune markers or what, what all are the markers that you're monitoring? Um, is it just immune or other things as well? Yeah. So we're checking immune markers, um, a lot of inflammatory markers. What we noticed was we're also monitoring some cardiovascular risk markers mm. because there was a doctor, Patrick Whelan, an MD, PhD, that was um, wrote a letter to, I think, one of the medic- primary medical journals talking about like some logical concerns he had before the vaccines came out in full force. Mm-hmm. And um, right here, we were basically doing, because he was concerned that potentially the part of the spike protein that the mRNA creates that protein Mm -hmm. could cause some cardiovascular risk before or part of why people are reacting to these vaccines before you make neutralizing antibodies and then take care Mm -hmm. of it. So the ones we're doing are basically high sensitivity C-reactive protein and Mm -hmm. homocysteine, which are checking for blood and cardiovascular inflammation and cellular inflammation. We're doing myeloperoxidase, PLAC, which are plaque risks, Mm -hmm. oxidative LDL. So like Is the LDL cholesterol getting oxidized, which Mm -hmm. is like rust on your car, which can cause hardening of the arteries. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a cholesterol panel, lipid panel, CBC with differential, CMP, GGT, sort of like liver gallbladder and some sed rate um, markers. That's great. So you're, you're really digging deep to see what are, what happens after. Right. Well, I didn't fully expect to dig deep, but the story behind it was I had a patient who had a moderate reaction Mm-hmm. And 16% of women who are getting the mRNA vaccines after the first or second will get lymph swelling or lymph node swelling in mm-hmm. their armpit, usually the side of the vaccine. Mm-hmm. And so they're warning women to not get their mammograms within right. like a month or if they have that swelling, to not get their mammograms afterwards because it could cause a false positive for like a mammogram mm-hmm. screening. Right. So. Um, when 16% of people are having that happen, it only happened in less than it was like 0.5% in the trials. Mm-hmm. But when you extrapolate to, that to millions of people, the trial data is not always accurate. So we had one of those patients where we were just doing her yearly blood work by chance. I actually was doing it like quickly, a 10 minute blood draw in the morning, didn't know she had the shot. And then I was like, oh, call her. I was like, what is going on with mm-hmm. your body? Like, cause her inflammation was 28 times normal. We wow. were healing her liver and her liver enzymes and some of her other enzymes were super high. So I was Insane. like, red flag. The lab actually called me and was like, is this patient okay? Like, oh my gosh. Wow. But it was basically, she was just having a, um, a post shot reaction. So I was like, okay, let's redraw your blood work. See if this goes down, which eventually it did, but it was still kind of like a red flag that I put on social media to and sent to other doctors Mm -hmm. to sort of like, let's actually start doing some of this research to see what's really going on. Right. And I've done about four patients now because like I was saying, not a lot of patients want to do this research, Mm -hmm. but most of them are looking fine. But it seems like the people who are, who had COVID and from other doctors I'm talking to who are starting to do this, people who had COVID and then got the vaccine within six months afterwards or at all, are having more of these reactions. So it's kind of like you already have some antibodies and you have a T cell response Mm -hmm. naturally to the infection. But then if you kind of like overstimulate and maybe create more antibodies than you might need, that could create more of this kind of like immune activation. Interesting. And and these are a bunch of question marks that people are just having to figure out on their own. Like, you know, it's, this hasn't been researched on, you know, and so doctors like you are talking And they're saying, hey, here are some red flags that we're seeing. Can we talk about how the COVID vaccine is actually different from the others? We're we're using buzzwords like mRNA and all that. How is it different from typical vaccines? So the mRNA technology is new, but not new. Mm -hmm. It's new as far as like mass human trials and studies, but it has been around for, I believe, almost a decade or more. 
but it's new because the delivery system is newer technology. So old school classic type vaccines are basically giving either a live or dead virus or part of the virus to and injecting that with some other things into your body to get your body to respond to a low dose of the virus, kind of like Princess Bride, where he starts taking small amounts of mm-hmm. toxins over time to like build up his immunity to the toxin. Yeah. It's basically like that. It's stimulating a small immune response where you usually don't get sick when you get the vaccine, mm-hmm. but you build an immune response to that live or dead virus or bacterial particle that's trying to build defense against. Right. So the mRNA is different because what the mRNA is doing is basically creating proteins in your body mm-hmm. that the mRNA basically is what a messenger RNA, you have your DNA and then you have your RNA and the DNA is like your blueprint, your code. The RNA is basically like the language of trying to read that code mm-hmm. and then trying to program it into proteins to actually make something useful out of your blueprint, right. like right. your house. So it's basically like the people going to get to work to make the house mm-hmm. and the message is basically all that's being inserted. It goes into the cell with PEG, gets it into the cell. And then the mRNA goes to your ribosomes and basically makes the protein. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't go directly to the DNA. And the biggest misconception we hit on a little earlier in some of the natural health community that was sort of bothering me was that they say like, oh, it's, you know, the vaccine is trying to manipulate or change your DNA. or You're going to be like a chimera or a completely new human afterwards, which is not in any way scientifically proven or there's basically like no logical reason why that would ever happen. Right. right. So the mRNA technology is basically just inserting some language to try to create protein antibody, create these proteins, spike proteins and part of the spike protein. Mm -hmm. And then your body creates the antibodies against it. And you have a defense against COVID-19. This is how I, and correct me if I'm wrong. And I probably should have like, brushed up on my cell uh, physiology, but this is how I always think of it. Um, if I always say the DNA is kind of like millions of chapters in a book, right? And it's, it's hiding in your cell and mm. you open yep. up, like if your body wants to create a certain protein, it will go to page like 2,362, create like, it'll come in, create a photocopy of that page and then take that photocopy and make the protein. And then that book closes and goes away, right? That's a great analogy. Right? Thank Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Really Great analogy. <laughs> and so, so your DNA is the book with the chapters. And so we're just figuring out what chapter we want to use and photocopy and then take that photocopy and make protein. And so the mRNA is kind of like the photocopy machine, right? It makes like the blueprint yep. it, it, and it, and then it takes that blueprint to the ribosomes and it makes the spike protein. So the chapters in the book hasn't been altered or changed at all. We just brought a different type of photocopy machine and, and not your normal natural photocopy machine it's a completely yeah. different one the book this your guys's dna you guys is totally fine it's just a different machine okay so so i really love that you explained it that way and that you are calling people out because you know junk pseudoscience gives everyone kind of in our world a really bad reputation and i'm hoping that we can bring to light like actually no we do yeah. know our stuff and we are trying to remain neutral and we're seeing both sides so thank you for describing that. So that, exactly. is, that is how the vaccine is different. Are there long-term health effects of the vaccine that are known right now, according to research and what we're seeing in the public eye? So none are known right now. It's going to take some time really right. to sort of like do some of these follow-up studies. And some of the people on the initial trial were given the vaccine later, so they can't be followed for years because after the trial right. was over right. or the set time for a couple of months was over, then they were given the vaccine to, you know, possibly help them if they wanted it. Mm-hmm. So we sort of have to just track overall patient population at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so we really right. don't know the long-term health effects. We're basically so guinea pigs right now. Logic is fast. Science is slow. Yeah, Data and doing research takes a long time to do. Sometimes like years, decades, it can take a full career to sort of like prove a medical point. And even then, if you're doing something that's contrary to the regular belief, you're going to basically be like, shamed or made fun of or there's going to be like oh he's just crazy or conjectured whatever it is there's people like dale bredesen who's wrote tons of books tons of research on alzheimer's and kind of like reversing Mm -hmm, cognitive mm -hmm. decline yeah but 
He's been ridiculed by his profession. And finally, mm-hmm. they're actually accepting him as like, wow, this guy Amazing. really knows what he's talking about. And his research is really good. And he's customizing the medicine to each patient. Like that's, we should have like, we should do medicine like that. Mm-hmm. But for 30 years, he was made fun of. But the yeah. long-term effects of health and interventions takes a while. And we just don't fully know yet what's going to happen from this new technology. Interesting. So basically, we are the long-term research project. We're just waiting and watching and we're seeing because, I mean, we've only known of COVID-19 for just over a year. Longitudinal studies are 5, 10, 15 years. We just have no idea. There is no, there's, there's no guarantee, basically. Actually, while you were talking, I was trying to look up the one research paper. Did you guys hear of this research paper done on homes? It was, uh, oh, I can't remember what kind of study it was, but I, I think you will know exactly what I'm talking about. It was done on homeschooled kids, and it was looking for neurological issues in each, like in homeschooled vaccinated children and homeschooled non-vaccinated children. Have you guys heard of that research paper by chance? No? I have not. Oh, I I have. I have. Yeah. Yeah. And what was really interesting, it was really hot for a few weeks and it was actually a peer reviewed study uh, paper, but it's been completely kind of like blacklisted and it's really hard to find now. And like no one's it was really interesting that, you know, they, they compared. And again, it's not the best research, but, you know, we are reviewing. We're looking at different populations and we're, we're seeing a disconnect or we're seeing a difference in neurological development in people that are vaccinated and non vaccinated. Again, this is a longitudinal effect uh, that I think people don't love to hear. And again, you can have neurological issues and still be alive. And so that's if that's a risk that you are willing to take, I think people should know these are your risks and you are in choice if you want to do it or not. And so um, I was just wondering if you guys have heard of that. So why isn't the vaccine approved for children? I think mostly because children and the elderly tend to either not react or need different vaccines than people from you know, 13, puberty, 18 years of age to about 55, 65. So mm-hmm. your immune system is developing and changing a lot. And you generally have a really strong immune system as a child. Mm-hmm. And then when you're elderly, however, you know, I don't like to classify someone as old, mm-hmm. but yeah. medically, I think when you're like retired or over 75 or 80, your immune system, your T cells, your thymus does start to decline a little bit mm-hmm. um, for most people. So Vaccines work differently in those populations, and they're either like more effective or less effective. So a lot of research to protect children is also not done at first with most vaccines. It's done in adults who are less mm-hmm. likely to have um, negative right. reactions to these things. Yeah. And if they do have negative reactions, like they're an adult, we don't feel as bad about it. Right. Um, that's why there's not a lot of research on children for these things. That's, that's true. But it's not approved. I think it's just starting to get approved. And Dr. Fauci was talking about how he sort of like is starting to recommend it for children now. Mm -hmm. But uh, it still hasn't been really tested. And they're starting to do those trials now. Okay. We briefly spoke about some short term side effects of the vaccine, like, you know, the swelling in breast tissue. Are there any other kind, any other known short term side effects of this vaccine that people should be mindful of? Yeah, the most common ones are where you get the shot, some pain or swelling. Mm -hmm. The rest of your body could have fever, chills, tiredness, or headache. Mm -hmm. Um, So some people are getting like achy, almost like fluish for a few hours to a few days. Like a normal flu vaccine Um, or something. It depends on the person. Mm -hmm. I think something like that, nothing too new or different. There are rare cases of worse adverse side effects, um, but we won't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> Would you say that with Unless those you want to. <laughs> with those short like side effects, um, like feeling like you have the flu, is it just something that's like, oh, this is temporary, it's uncomfortable, or is there something that's a concern with that? That it's like you really don't feel well, aside from just like you need to get over it. Is there any concern with that that they feel like they have a bad flu? Um, there's generally not a concern. No, I mean. But I mean, some of our research shows it could be mildly concerning, which is why we're doing that research. But the vaccines are meant to stimulate your immune system. Right. And when you stimulate the immune system to fight off an infection, you usually get a fever. So everyone who's trying to suppress a fever um, with medication could be somewhat harming their long-term immune protection right. from those things, um, which is why they were telling people who were getting the vaccines to not really use Tylenol unless they really needed it. Mm-hmm. Because when you get a fever when you're sick or when you're creating antibodies, you also 
that fever helps you create long-term defense. So right. when you do take Tylenol or fever suppressants when you're sick, sometimes you don't get the T cell memory immune support that's as good as you need. Mm-hmm. So it's not concerning to have those side effects. And the reason why I'm not talking about the ones that are super rare is because, again, we don't really know if that was just happening in the trials or not. And just don't want to like cause more people to be scared than they need to be. Right. Absolutely. And do we know how long? Because but There are okay. other things that are happening from some of these vaccines. Okay. I have to go. Do we know how long? So do we know how long the vaccine is supposed to confer immunity? Because we know that the virus is mutating so quickly. And so I guess that's two different questions. So do we know like how long the the vaccine is supposed to last? Is it supposed to be a lifetime short? Like, do we get booster shots? So the, what I've been saying since the beginning is that this is more, once it becomes past the tipping point where tons of people have had this thing Mm -hmm. and it's likely to become endemic sort of like a flu or cold season Mm -hmm. um, where it might last forever or it could last for five years or 10 years Mm -hmm. before it sort of dwindles down and the flu becomes more virulent or more contagious, which means this is likely going to become more like a flu shot and where you might need a booster, you might need the new type every year. And the, the benefit of the mRNA is that they can actually tweak it and have more shots ready to go within weeks to a month Mm -hmm. um, because it's much easier and faster to develop in production because all I have to do is change the protein code and then create it. So um, they don't have to grow it as much like other old vaccines, Mm -hmm. but we don't know how long it lasts at the beginning. The lowest one people were saying like, it might only last give you two months of benefit. That was North Carolina Mm -hmm. department of health and human services. Mm -hmm. And then there were people who were saying six months of benefit, could you know the obviously like the ceo of pfizer and moderna are saying it could last like a year or more yeah it's a good sign it shows it does seem to stimulate some t-cell memory memory t-cells and helper t-cells which means it could last longer than the two to six months initially thought but we really have no idea logically based on other past vaccine knowledge we can kind of estimate that it would be about three to six months because the virus Mm. mutates right very regular and there's now like four new ones in the u.s that were created just in the u.s and -hmm. viruses do tend to evolve or mutate to bypass whatever we put in front of them so if we put masks or vaccines we tend Mm -hmm. to get vaccine resistant flu or vaccine resistant covid or something like it becomes a little more contagious that goes around or through the mask more or becomes more contagious that way so I think that's why the flu vaccine is somewhere between 12 to 50 percent effective every year is because the, by the time we make it get out, give it to people and they build an immune defense, the virus has already mutated, mutated. quite a bit. Right. So, so it's do you not think, a perfect science. So do you think that that's what this will be like then it is ongoing? Like we don't know. It's just indefinite how long we might have to keep chasing it with vaccines like the flu vaccine versus like we did it. We beat it. It's done. You know, we don't have to see any vaccines for COVID anymore. My, yeah, that would be my best guess is that we're going to have to kind of yeah. keep doing a booster or something every year. Mm, yeah. But there, because I believe so much of America has had this already, right. it is possible that it goes away in two to five years. I kind of look at some different resources. Like I look at news from the left, from the right, from the middle, from Reuters, BBC, and I look at what the banks are predicting because the people with lots of money have lots of financial interest in Mm -hmm. what happens with COVID and it's made off of it. Right. And they were sort of saying they think it's going to last. Now this is, let me like pre-warn you, but they sort of, it's, it's conjecture obviously, but they Mm -hmm. sort of were saying that the financial side effects will likely last till 2025. So that's kind of like the middle ground of, I think if I had to take a guess, I'd say it might be another couple of years before it's like gone completely, but we could probably get back to our fairly normal lives. And I mean, some States are basically in their normal lives anyways. Right. And have yeah, is it changed. is it kind of like where we hit a point where so many people have it that do you think that we'll hit a point where we're like, well, masks really aren't necessary anymore because not because COVID is gone, but because so many of us have just gotten it already? I believe so. My hope is that we let go of the mask thing yeah. um, at some point because I don't like the headspace that it gives people and children in particular Mm -hmm. of fearing their bodies, fearing germs, because most germs are actually good for us. And we're a hundred times more germ than we are human. And a quadrillion viruses in every square meter of air, which is more stars than there are in the universe. 52% of our DNA has been changed by viruses. So they're not actually all bad for us. They help our bodies evolve and adapt and and grow and change. So 
the sort of the philosophy of the mask, I don't really love. But at some point, I think you're right. Like we'll have enough of a herd immunity, whether it's from natural immunity or from the vaccine induced immunity, however long that lasts. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the mask will probably slowly come off and some people will be like, I'm done with them. You know, some people are already done with them and other people will keep wearing them or they'll wear them in certain circumstances. I think the middle ground that I would like to see that maybe should have even happened a while ago is to wear like an actually effective mask when you're sick. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. The problem with COVID is that people, you know, there are certain times when there are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic spreaders of COVID. Right. But I think the one thing that'll probably get taken away for a long time is my guess is our general culture will start to be more of like Asian cultures where if you are sick, Mm. you're more likely to stay home from school or you're more likely to wear a mask out of respect for others. I think my biggest fear with all of this isn't even the mask thing, but it's our culture that we are creating and generating because people are very hostile towards each other now. And that I feel like that is just as toxic, if not more so. I mean, how much has mental illness gone up in the past year? And, you know, not even that, but economies in third world countries are completely plummeting. And like, and here in our first world country, we're not even conscious of that. That's not even on our radar. It's on my radar because I know a lot of people that live in South Africa, you know, and so I I get the downloads all the time on like how the economy is doing there. And it's not doing good. I think they're at over 50% unemployment, like in the country. And it was high before it was like, yes, it's, it's really bad. And it was pretty high before it was like 35% unemployment and they're over 50 now that half the country are unemployed. And a lot of these people, like these households, there's four families that live off of one person's paycheck. That person is unemployed. We have four families that are not getting fed, right? It's really dire. And like, I don't think we will ever, ever, ever be able to measure the ripple effect of other people's lives and like other people's mental wellness and the amount of, oh, I don't know, it's the word I'm looking for, hate and negativity that we are giving to each other in our society, you know, especially a country, our country that is so divided already. We just throw this inflammatory like topic in there and people are even angrier at each other when what we really need is more love and unity and like respect, right? And so I know this was like, (laughs) we were supposed to be talking about masks, but you know, masks are just the symbol of the bigger issue at hand here. And I hope that I really, really hope that we can someday get to a a point where we can heal these wounds that we have gaping open in our society right now. That's, that's my, thank you for coming to my Ted talk. (laughs) So, um, I just, I I just noticed that people just aren't, I feel like it's friendly in general, like just walking past people. So mean people just feel very on edge that like, all the time, look at you, like you are diseased and like fearful and nobody Mm -hmm. smiles and say, hi, how are you anymore? I feel like the friendliness has gone down a lot. A a lot. I see a little bit of both. Yeah. I'm, I'm the guy like trying to just wake everybody up and try to like, sing and dance and be friendly and smile at people, you know, with my eyes and that kind of stuff. But I see a little bit of both. And some people like children will join in and come dance with me literally like I was at the airport and like I got some kids to dance with me today. So that was fun. But Mm -hmm. I feel like there are people where, you know, my intuition, I'm like up there. I can just feel like I'm like singing and whistling and doing whatever Mm -hmm. outdoors. And like, I can sense like, Oh, they're not going to like that. And they like roll down their car window or like close their windows, you know, to like hide. But there are other people who are sort of like bonding and coming together more than ever during this time. I think that's also really nice to see. I think it just takes a couple of us to sort of like start to preach love and unity and connection. Absolutely, We've learned how much we need to touch people and be in real connection with people in in person right all these ceos who are like wow we can't wait to have everybody work from home and we're going to be more productive and get Mm. more done they're going to like be with their kids and then they're like wow they're actually less creative right there's a lot of downsides to not having people meet in person exactly um and the morale of the team sort of drops a little bit so there's definite side effects i definitely agree with you about how i think i saw something 270 million people are going hungry because of the lockdowns so it's Mm. a very complex nuanced subject mental health and children has doubled in children so wow there was a high school in children mental health illness has doubled oh my gosh. Um, the prescription meds <gasps> at the start of the pandemic and even now are going up for psych meds that's so sad um, there was a high school that the lead high school football player near chicago in the burbs here 
who was like a friend of a friend, he committed suicide, their quarterback. Oh. So that oh actually gosh. caused a big devastation in our community, but it led the school to open up sooner Amazing. and the communities kind of like come together over it, which is right. great, but it's such a, there's so much tragedy happening because so of much. how we're reacting right. to this. But, but I think you're right. People don't see it in other countries. They sort of see like, well, my family's fine or my town's fine, mm-hmm. but the big picture perspective is pretty rough. And this, yeah. this does happen in like every pandemic in history. I've been doing some research and like 1918, this is what happens. Unfortunately, like the lower classes and third world countries do sort of like take the hit and yeah. it's, it's just going to be a long repair healing growth and process of sort of like charity for the people who are able to right. to do that right is this a good time to maybe talk about the culture around the vaccine debate or conversation i don't even want to call it a debate Ooh. because people go into a debate trying to win right? Is, is this a good segue to talk about the vaccine conversation and why it is so polarizing and why you think there is so much gaslighting around people's stories uh, when they say, I have a vaccine injured child, or I was vaccine injured, or I know someone that's vaccine injured. Why, why are we not okay listening to these people's stories, do you think? Because it's just, I, that's I feel- That's a great question. Right. Because like- I, I do want to say that vaccines do save lives. They do. And I want to say that it, it saves a lot of lives. But we also need to recognize, too, that it is not 100 percent safe. And so allowing people to be educated about the risks and they're they're small, right? They're small risks. But if we get more educated, like you were mentioning, Dr. Campbell, about like our MTHFR gene mutations, what was the other gene that you were talking about? in the beginning that you had, what was that one called? But I think um, it's the HQ gene, HQ2. Okay. I believe. Yeah. Because you know, HLADQ2. HLADQ2. Um, is that the one that you can't uh, detox mold as well? Very rarely. Or is that a different one I'm thinking of? It's probably a different one. Never mind. That's well, uh, very similar. I have a whole chart, but the HLA genes are all like immune system genes that relate yeah. to mold and autoimmunity and uh, Okay. But like, this is real. Like we do have these genes in us and they do inhibit us from doing certain things. I'll, I'll kind of give an example. I shared this on my stories because a lot of my followers have asked, like, are my children vaccinated? Well, one is and one isn't. And the reason why that is, is I actually did a delayed vaccine schedule for my son, Tennyson. I wanted his neurological system to be like fully developed and, and his immune system to be really stabilized and his gut microbiota to be a little bit more mature. So we vaccinated him after the age of three he was three and a half I, and I watched him and I monitored him throughout the ages of one two three and I was like okay like everything looks kosher let's do this with my daughter not so much she was born with a sacral dimple she has fused kidneys she had the stork bites she had all of these signs and symptoms of MTHFR gene mutations and so when I look at her case history I'm like I don't feel comfortable. I have the MTHF, the, the, the worst kind of gene mutations, right? And I've had health issues in my past. And so I'm actually very, very careful about what I put in my body and on my body. And, I, and I've been mindful of that for years and years and years. So when I look at my daughter and I see her signs and symptoms of her mutations, and I'm like, okay, she's definitely got more issues with her methylation than her brother. You know, she bruises easily. And so she's not going to, as long as I can do it for until they force vaccinate, and hopefully that doesn't happen, I won't vaccinate her just because of her genetic makeup. So, so that was a choice that I could make based on my education and my, my background and knowing my children. And I think that's what I want people to understand listening. Like, one, you should have the choice. You shouldn't be shamed into making a decision. You are entitled to knowledge around your health history in your family and your children. And then you should make an informed decision and not be bullied into that decision. And it should be respected. And we're not having that respect in this world. I'm curious, have you had pushback from other people? And I always wondered, you know, I I don't have children. So I Mm -hmm. always thought that was really difficult. And if I had children and they had gene mutations, you know, would I also make that call? And, you know, have you had a hard time with other parents and in the decisions that you've made? 
No, I, I mean, Tristan was very on board before cancer. Tristan, he was very like, we have to vaccinate, blah, 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 blah. And then after cancer, Tristan was like, actually, wait a second. When I'm looking at the research, mm-hmm. like there are these other factors. I haven't been shamed by friends or family. Maybe they're keeping it to themselves and that's fine. I live in a pretty conservative state that's very pro-freedom. So the only pushback that I've had is we have to watch this really dumb video when we enroll our kids into public school and it's basically a video shaming you for not vaccinating your child. And so we just watch it and then we check. Yes, we watched it. And yeah, (laughs) it's like, see how dangerous you are being. Look at how this child is dangerous to the other children in the classroom. And we're like, yeah, okay, thanks. You know, (laughs) thank you for that. But, but that's it. And, and I think my circles of friends are, are pretty crunchy. So, you know, they don't try to shame me about that. But I know other people aren't as lucky as me and they have tons of pushback. Oh, the most shaming I get are actually from doctors. So doctors, they kind of give you the side eye and they're like, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yes, I know. I know these things. Thank you. And, and so they, they try to like, there's a lot of like pressure to vaccinate your children. And then they give you the lecture of, well, you're just being dangerous and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I just, I just have to, you know, double down and be like, I understand. Thank you. This is a risk that my family family is, uh, you know, like this is what we're doing. I don't expect my children's doctors to understand methylation and MTHFR gene mutations. I, that's not their job. I pay them to do other things. It's my job to know my family's health history as much as I can, right? They, they can understand our family's health history from a medical standpoint point, but they're not trained in medical school to look at these things. You know, they're, they're trained to like, memorize their modalities and their protocols and their medications, right? They're medical doctors. They're not, you know, geneticists in alternative circles. And so I'm not going to expect my doctor to be that person. So I hope that answered your question. But no, I haven't had a lot of pushback. And I guess maybe people are too scared to fight me on it. I don't know. I don't want to fight people on it. Let me just put that out there. So yeah, I'm it, glad it's been okay. you haven't had a lot of pushback here. But I think I'm glad you haven't had a lot of pushback. No, it's been really great. But I know people in California, they get a lot of pushback and a lot of shaming and a lot of uh, women online that I talk with. They they a lot of them are actually trying to like move out of state because of um, all the stuff happening in California right now. It's it's really tragic. But let me ask you guys, like, why do you think we are gaslighting people about their stories? Like, how did we get here and why is this happening? So I think it's because it's just a huge, it would be a gigantic cognitive dissonance to admit that we might be harming children or might be harming anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, Medical doctors, I have tons of family and friends and colleagues who I co-treat with that are medical doctors and some who vaccinate and some who are pediatricians who vaccinate many children and some will vaccinate some of their clients. But it's just really hard to admit that one of the primary therapies they're doing right. could be making the vaccinated children less healthy or their immune systems less healthy over the decade or two that they're doing all these childhood vaccines, mm-hmm. the unvaccinated children. So it's not that they're bad people. It's not that they, but they don't learn a lot of the research in school. Right. Um, they usually only get like a cl- less than a class. Usually it's like a class or two or a day or two on the vaccines. And a lot of those textbooks are paid by Pfizer, paid by the pharmaceutical right. companies. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like they're getting the one side of the story. And like right. you said, you can't expect them to be a geneticist or be on the cutting edge of medicine mm-hmm. because medical schools typically 20 to 50 years behind the times because the board exams take about 50 years to sort of change to modern medicine and modern right scientific understanding and knowledge. So it takes a generation before these things start to evolve and the MTHFR gene and those things might become part of genetic vaccine genomic research. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just why my veterinarian was able to admit that dogs have vaccine reactions that are well-known and well-researched, but a pediatrician is not always able to talk about those things is because we care about children so much often more than ourselves. Right. I'm not a parent, but even my dog, like sometimes you care more about your dog and people yeah. are willing to spend $5,000 on your dog's little like lump surgery, but mm. not $50 on an organic steak or something like that. Right. So I think we care so much about our children and our pets, but um, it would just be a huge cognitive distance to admit that there might be some 
downside to these things, especially when it's unfortunately become very politicized and very heated. Right. And um, doctors don't like being wrong. They don't like admitting that they might be doing something wrong. But right. 50% of medical procedures are not understood or proven by science. And there's a lot of things that take 10 to 20 years to really mm-hmm. reverse. Like sometimes knee arthroscopic surgery is completely shown to not work in any type of science beside just like a placebo, but we still do it or we still give antibiotics for most ear infections. And for most ear infections, we don't need to give antibiotics. So there's a lot of things that just take 20 to 50 years to really start to shift. I think the only way to start to shift it is to really love your doctors. It's like when you want to argue with someone, usually sometimes you can just like bulldoze them and yell at them. But most of the time, if you do it from like a loving, compassionate place Mm -hmm. and you start to understand like, look, they really care. They're just trying to do the best they can with what they know. And you might know more about MTHFR than your doctor now. Um, But you might inspire your doctor to go look those things up if you come from a place of love and compassion. So that's what I try to do with every doctor Mm -hmm. I consult with. And that really helps a lot. I love that. So you're not telling him like, I know more than you, or you might be wrong or look at this research. You're like, Hey, have you seen this? Like I'm concerned. I'm trying to do the best for my kid. I know you mean well, but like I have these other doctors who are talking about MTHFR and vaccine genomics. And I'm a little concerned. Could you like look it up or read this book for me or right. whatever it is. But yeah. I think when you come from compassion, it helps hugely. I love that. One that... thing I'd love to hear if this is just, if this is just talk or if there's any truth around this too, that I'm hearing with the vaccine that it may not necessarily help with viral transmission and keeping that from happening, but just lessening your symptoms and making it easier on your body. If you do mm-hmm. get it, is there truth around that? There's a lot of truth around that. And it's probably one of the most important points we haven't mentioned so far. And that's why they're saying you still have to wear a mask or distance afterwards is because it might help with lowering transmission or lowering your chance of getting infections. Mm -hmm. But that's not what it was really designed to do, Mm -hmm. nor what it was studied to do or researched to do. Because there were people in the trial that got the vaccine and still got COVID. Mm, there were and the data was not that great if you want to really like dive deep into it you can look at peter doshi d-o-s-h-i in the british medical journal he sort of talks about the downsides of the trial data and um what that means but one of those downsides was that there are still people getting the vaccine who could spread covid and they could spread covid more unknowingly because they have mild symptoms because 80 percent of people have no symptoms or mild symptoms anyways and now that we're going to vaccinate a lot of people there's going to be even more people having no or mild symptoms. So that could be a great thing because it could end COVID faster. Amazing. If we all spread COVID and get COVID Mm. without knowing it, or 80% of people don't know it, it could end the pandemic even sooner, which could be like a unknowing good thing, but it does. Yeah. We really just don't know yet, but we are pretty sure that you can still get COVID and spread it after doing the vaccine. Could it be fair then to say like, okay, let's say I'm young, I'm healthy. I feel like I've got a good fighting chance that if I get COVID, it'll maybe it won't feel good, but I'll be okay. Like, is it fair to be like, if if it's lessening my symptoms, I'll take my chance. I'll skip the vaccine. I mean, there's so much of an uproar around, like if you don't get the vaccine, you're being irresponsible. But I feel like this would kind of negate that. Would you say that that's, you know, is that yeah, okay? That I think I've, that's <laughs> accurate. Is that fair? No, it's totally accurate because it's really not, the vaccine would not be protecting anybody except for yourself. Right. So there right. are people, because they're basing it off what they know about old vaccines, they're basically saying like, oh, I'm going to get it so I protect my grandma. Mm-hmm. But really, it's when not- you, if you're younger and you get the vaccine, you might have COVID but not know it and be mm-hmm. less likely to know it and you actually might hurt your grandma even more. That's so interesting. Giving her so, that interesting. so interesting. So, yeah. I'm so, so glad we brought that up. I know. Interesting. Because yeah. that's definitely yeah, not a narrative a that point. everyone's talking about. Like no one is saying that. Like you, it doesn't necessarily mean you get the vaccine and now you've done your part. No, you haven't. You're still you can still be a carrier. That's so fascinating. Sorry, keep going, Dr. Campbell. I interrupted you. No, pretty much done. I think that's kind of It's a really important point. And for most people, I'm saying like a lot of people say like, well, when it's bad, it's like the flu or when it's bad, it's like a Mm -hmm. bad pneumonia. Um, I think my personal take is that there's the vasculitis 
vascular inflammation that happens from COVID mm-hmm. and then secondary infections yeah. like bacterial infections or parasitic or mold candida infections mm-hmm. can make it much worse, which is why they're also using antibiotics or other so, things like ivermectin or antiparasitics yeah. to basically like try to fight the infection or basically co-infections wow. and getting some success with that. Yeah. But I think that for people who feel like they could handle COVID, it's totally okay for you to say, you know, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm willing to take the risk of like getting COVID or I already think I had COVID or maybe I'm going to check my antibodies to see if I already had COVID. And if you already had COVID, there's really not much of a need to get the vaccine. And we're doing the most well-researched antibodies in the entire U.S. that Mayo Clinic helped develop with our lab. Mm -hmm. And we check for 12 antibodies, not just one or two. And we're finding that they last for nine to 12 months, not just three to four. So that's a big key point is that you might actually be protected for nine to 12 months after. And the T cells could last for years after you've had COVID. Amazing. And that the majority of America has pretty much already had COVID. Yeah. So the numbers as far as like cases and deaths and all that are likely way off, way high and way low in different ways. But what we Mm -hmm. do know logically is that 20% of Chicago and California and New York had antibodies in July. Mm -hmm. When Northwestern University was doing their studies, we know that 20% had antibodies. Those antibodies will start going away. So we can't keep doing that research, unfortunately. But with how the cases have gone in the winter, we should be at 40 to 60% of kind of like those major areas by now. So it's something to think about. Amazing. It's like maybe, you know, the majority of the country doesn't need the vaccine because they already have this natural right. protection. Right. Well, and that it, it's just mutating like the flu, like we mentioned earlier, it's mutating. So we're going to have to update the vaccine all the time anyway. So if you had antibodies for the mutation from three months ago, you are still going to be exposed to the mutation now, you know, so you're still going to potentially get a different type of COVID, right? So you're, we're always chasing ghosts. And when really... I mean, we haven't even started to discuss this aspect, but people are not emphasizing nutrition enough and health and wellness. You know, Gina, you, you use the word irresponsible. People are saying that you're irresponsible if you don't get the vaccine. But isn't there like, aren't we being irresponsible by not taking care of our bodies? I mean, there's, there's been research around having adequate amounts of vitamin D can decrease your chance of uh, getting infected or having really bad symptoms. You know, having adequate amount of vitamin C can help with that people that tend to have less diseases. Yeah. Like eat more plants, right. Um, get more sunlight. Aren't we being irresponsible by not taking care of ourselves? Because like, so irresponsible. We're so irresponsible. Nobody talks about like how important it is. Like your mitochondrial reserve that like your mitochondria, your cells can actually be healthy enough so that you can like mount a proper immune response to be able to like get enough nutrients and yes. nobody's talking about like just having a nutrient dense diet right. so that your cells can work properly and your body can actually you have enough metabolic reserve to be mm-hmm. able to have a proper immune response right i, right. Totally. I think now that we're pretty sure this is going to be here for months to years it's really important mm-hmm. to start to take care of your health and take care of those things because there's tons of research showing c zinc quercetin, which is a, gets the zinc into the cell, mm-hmm. plant-based diets, the less frail you are, the yeah. more healthy you are, the less inflammation you have. Those mm-hmm. patients with less comorbidities are doing much better than the other patients who are right. getting it. And like, yes, I'm just, it's one of those things that I think we should have been preaching from the start. Like no doctor is perfect. I think Dr. Fauci is generally doing a good job, but he was taking D, C and zinc all year. And Mm -hmm. until the fall, he didn't come out and say it, but like, why is our public health system not telling us to take care of our health, start working out, getting healthier. That should be like one of the first steps into building your immune system, not an right. I think I've seen on like the CDC guidelines, like maybe one or two paragraphs of like, make sure you're getting adequate nutrition. And then everything else is like masks this and masks that. And like the, the policies are always changing and, and social distancing and this and that. And, you know, everything, it's not a black and white situation, you know, and unfortunately we've turned it into black and white and there's so many shades of gray here. And I think it's very unbecoming as a society for us to point at someone else and say, you're doing it wrong and you're being irresponsible because we can have person A get a vaccine, drink tons of soda and eat McDonald's all day. 
someone like me could say, well, you're being irresponsible, right? And then they turn around and they see me exercising, eating plant-based, like eating my healthy foods and not getting vaccinated and say, I'm being irresponsible. And we're going to get nowhere with that kind of attitude, right? Like I'm really hoping that discussions like this can kind of dissolve the black and white uh, debates and allow us to just really see each other as individuals with differing opinions and differing belief systems and core values. And we can just respect that and recognize that we're all trying the best we can with what we know. And I don't like none of us want more people to die. Right. So I'm going to show up for my society the best way I know how. And someone else is going to show up the best way that they know how. And it's just going to look different. So this faulting everyone, I'm hoping that we can stop this victim mentality because we're not all victims and we're not all villains. And, you know, like we I think when we get stuck in that mindset, it's just going to snowball more hate and vitriol and disrespect in our society that already has so much of that. I couldn't agree more. So anyways, is is there anything else that you guys want to, um, Dr. Campbell, can you tell everyone you have an Instagram, you have like a YouTube channel, right? Like how do people find your info and more, more about you and what you do? So I started a nonprofit right before COVID to help lower income, but we, because of COVID, we had to switch to online education. Mm -hmm. But if you look up, just Google health assurance movement, It'll come up. It's healthassurancemovement.org is our website, and that links to the Instagram and nonprofit and that kind of stuff. Our YouTube channel is also Health Assurance Movement. So I have some old lectures on adrenals and thyroid and stuff like menopause that I did on there. Very cool. And um, so that's all up there on YouTube. There's some old stuff, and then there's some like video blogs I've been doing. We're doing a cooking show. We have the first three episodes up of a cooking show we've been cool. working on. And then holistic Dr. Campbell on Instagram. I'm also there as well for kind of more of my uncensored self. Mm-hmm. YouTube is like more of the professional side, and then the yeah. Instagram is sort of like the fun, playful. Smart. I'm also a stand-up comedian. <laughs> yeah. I'm working on that. So that's awesome. I put a lot of stuff that's up really that's cool. like short videos to just like entertain and kind of get some thought-provoking info out there. Wow, well, you're you're a man well, of I'd many have to hats. Say this <laughs> conversation was so refreshing. Yeah. And, and I, it's been so nice to be able to have this conversation. I've been a little bit resistant to having, you know, COVID and vaccine discussions because of the intensity on each side and not like a willingness to be able to just look at like, what is the data? What is, does it make sense from a science perspective? And just Mm -hmm. to be able to have not a pass, such a passion driven conversation, Um, without talking about like the evidence. And so this has just been so refreshing. Yes. Thank you, you guys. Yeah, I agree. It's been a really, really beautiful conversation. Thank you. And the takeaway that I get is just depending on if you're young or old, your genetic makeup, deciding whether to get the vaccine is very, very personal. For me and my family, I just don't, there's just not enough longitudinal data for me. So like, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm saying on air, like, I don't feel comfortable vaccinating my children yet, but I am going to wait and watch and see what data like Dr. Campbell and other doctors like him bring up to the surface as they do their own private testing on their clients and patients. What about for people who um, maybe recently like got COVID or they're, they're fighting it or they're trying to prevent it? Do you have resources? Yes. It's yeah. a great question. Um, assurance movement.org there's a coronavirus section where you have kind of like immune system protocols or some of the detoxification immune support that could possibly help logically with some of the vaccine reactions and um yeah we have a bunch of that stuff on there for free for people to look at um things that you and i were mentioned earlier like glutamine and vitamin C and all that stuff. But yeah, there's basically mm-hmm. healthassurancemovement.org has a bunch of those free resources on there for people. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, you guys, thank you so much for, for bringing in your knowledge and your talents around this. Um, Dr. Campbell, how do you do all of these things? <laughs> like you must be working from sunup till sundown because you got a lot of platforms and a lot of websites and, and you see patients. Um, it's, um, it's, it's very impressive. I do. Do you sleep? Yeah, I do. I do do quite a lot. Now I sleep, I go to bed at like eight and then I wake up at four and start doing Start education working. and research and That's work, awesome. while I'm working out in the morning and then it's really cool work from seven to seven go home eat sleep again and then I'm a three-day weekend to really decompress oh that's really but yeah I do I'm super passionate I love it and I've just been 
loving this medicine ever since I got in a decade ago. I love it. Well, thank you again for your time, Gina. Thank you for co-hosting with me and you listeners. Thank you for listening. If you've made it this far, um, hopefully we can go about these topics more gently with like softer hands because there's so much repairing that we need to do from each side and I hope someday we can get to a point where we can discuss these things without the heatedness and the anger and resentment so you guys thank you for listening Dr. Campbell thank you for your time thank you for doing all the research for people like us that don't have the time to do it and until next time you guys have a great week bye everybody 